Last speaker of this segment before we take a quick break uh, is uh, Michael Russell. Uh, he's going to be talking about retooling police deployment. Michael, here he comes. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to give you the standard uh, little quote that I have to give when I speak here. I know a couple people in the audience may know me. Uh, I am a current serving police member in the city of Victoria, uh, but those views that I express here today are that of my own and not necessarily of the department that I serve in. So I just have to throw that out there right at the beginning just to make sure everybody's okay. It's, on re it's recorded, so everybody knows now. <laughs> so what I'm going to talk about today is a retooling of police deployment, how to better and more effectively serve the communities that we're honored to serve in. And what better ways that our department and our communities can work together and piece together what we have right now, which is a fractured system. So modern policing evolved in the late 1800s, and what you see today is a direct and somewhat unevolved version of that ori original manifestation under Sir Robert Peel. The simple idea that the police are the citizens and the citizens are the police is still seen as a tenant of modern policing. Unfortunately, that very statement, which should serve as a foundation for any development, tends to be more important to the new recruit to, re to memorize for their testing than for a department to use as a guiding principle, or for the citizens of a community to understand as a means for its society to function. Modern police forces are under fire, make no mistake about it. With a constant barrage of media and public interest and scrutiny, departments are finding themselves in a public affairs battle. And they're trying to grasp onto ever-shrinking approval ratings rather than focusing their energy into engaging the community. Cities and the citizens within are questioning the ballooning budgets of police departments, and this one expenditure ranks at the top of almost every municipal budget. This momentum cannot be, cannot be sustained. Throwing money at policing simply provides a status quo. A new model must be found. So what is the answer? How do we reverse the trend, and how do we engage the community in a meaningful change? Well, it started in the 1980s with Superintendent Chris Braden of the Edmonton Police Service. He started championing community policing within Canada. It had been going elsewhere in the world and over in Europe, but it started in Canada in the 1980s. The idea of engaging citizens to uh, create a safe and happy community took off, and it was adopted throughout Canada in those interim years. However, just like the quote from Sir Robert Peel, community policing is often seen simply as a catchphrase now. Although, if you look at the Police Act, it is legislated here in BC. Most departments only provide a handful of officers to focus on community policing. This tends to be the forgotten section and is not given the weight in the department that I feel it should be, partially because I work in community policing. That's an aside. <laughs> Just call it job preservation. Unfortunately, the reality is that we're so busy chasing calls that we're not given or do not have the time to devote to truly engaging community members throughout our regular work, and that's just the truth of where we're at today in modern policing. Rather than using the idea of community policing as a basis for the structure and deployment of a police department, a few officers are assigned to work in the community on a small scale with limited resources. In 2011, this needs to look a little different. Scholars have studied policing but have failed to make any fundamental changes in the way business is done. I believe, like other speakers before me, that change can be found through collaboration with members in our community, police officers, academics, and other stakeholders, and I see this done through community-based research. Community-based research would allow us to bring together academics, police officers, other citizens, both those with and without lived experience, <coughs> to see how we could change the way police departments integrate within our community. The exciting part of this is there's no limit as to what can be studied and who can be invited to be part of the collaboration or part of this circle. Each member is seen as an equal and their voice has equal influence and weight. Unlike traditional law enforcement academics, which you see cited all the time in the newspaper or on TV, typically studies criminology or use of force. Community-based research is interdisciplinary and can touch all aspects of a department, from developing business models for more effective deployment, to the economic practices, to excellent in human, excellence in human resources. When we invite fellow citizens to be with us through the change and be that impetus for the change, we can start to break down the walls of mistrust, uh, secrecy, and misunderstandings. Common paradigms would have to change, and we'd have to see this type of research as valuable and important. 
Not every problem in the world can be solved by experts, academics, or those outside our communities to guide, suggest, and solutions for these problems. The solutions are here within us. The drive and need for change is within us. We just need an outlet to give it a voice. Police departments must realize the importance of this type of engagement. This cannot be turned into just another catchphrase. We must be the ones that develop these community-based research groups. We must be able to come to the table and lay bare the issues facing us and ask for open and honest communication. We must be willing to accept both criticism and compliment and imagine, and imagine creative and collaborative solutions. We must be ready to accept the bad along with the good. Conversely, the members of the community and, ac and academia who are engaged in this research must come here with an open mind. They must be able to see past any personal bias to see their honest, constructive input will make a meaningful and measurable difference. This has to be shown at the outset. We as a community have to show that equal weight is given to each voice. Am I saying that we need to turn hundreds of police officer facilitators loose in our communities? No, no, I'm certainly not. As one who is out there doing that, certainly don't need hundreds of them. But we need to realize that we, what we have now does not work effectively. We could pull the room right here and ask that exact question, how effectively is it working? And we each come up with different answers. We cannot sustain what we have. As a society, we must be able to take responsibility for the things that are happening in our communities. Society cannot simply think that making more laws or rules will solve anything. We can sit around inside our four walls and speculate on a problem, uh, speculate or problem solve all day. However, this will not lead to change. It will lead to more of the same. Don't mistake my passion for a non-belief in academia. A crucial point of this research is inviting those who have specific, focused, and detailed attention to points that we are exploring. This depth of knowledge, when brought together in rea with reality in the world of community members, opens new doors that we cannot even begin to imagine. Academics is such an important part of what I believe we need, need in community-based research. However, it's just that it is a part of it. I speak in depth about academia and later on lived experience, but we cannot leave out a crucial part of this equation. Police officers, that's what we do. Uh, for each officer will bring a different background, different experience, expertise, and passion to this discussion. Like I said before, the group is about equal representation of voices. I'm not suggesting a simple system of dictation where the community comes in and tells the police department what we do, but a, giving a system for us to follow, rather a system that allows us to come to a solution together. Just like every other social service agency, we need to engage those that we serve. We, let's not forget that we're here to protect and serve. It's a very important part that tends to get left out. Let's look at those that are making differences in the lives that they serve every day. The third sector, the nonprofits. The nonprofits use lived experience to guide what happens in their organization. The guidance is crucial. It allows us to see inside the decisions we make as an organization and see what uh, effects it has on society. How amazing is that? We can look directly at the results of what has done before us by inviting those with lived experience into our research and see what has worked and what has not. How would we change the things to make a more positive impact? How are the decisions we made in our four walls affecting the people we serve? I think that the part of the research must realize that the invitation to this research, the questions asked and the openness had, could be more important than the end result. The openness shows a willingness, an eagerness, and an acceptance that not all, not all the answers are owned by the professionals. To engage the community in such an effective way to will lead to further dialogue, further acceptance, and further support. Peter Block, an author that I quite like reading, has a book called Community. In that book, he says that the small unit will be the catalyst to change in our world. I truly believe this, and if we want change, and we want to grow as an organization that serves with our community, we have to embrace it. We must believe in change. Thank you.